Five young American men caught while allegedly planning to fight against American troops. It's a heck of a headline. Tonight, five young Americans are under arrest in Pakistan, suspected, according to Pakistani police, of trying to go fight against American forces in Afghanistan. The five disappeared late last month from the suburbs of Washington, D.C. They apparently told their parents nothing. They did leave behind a worrying farewell videotape that purportedly talked about the need for Muslims to join the war with the West. That's the point at which things maybe started to work the way they're supposed to. Family members of the missing young men reportedly sought some advice and help from the Council on American-Islamic Relations. CARE put the families in touch with the FBI. The FBI started looking for the men. They ended up contacting Pakistani authorities, who also took these allegations seriously. By now, the five young men had made their way to Pakistan, where they allegedly met with two different terror groups and asked to be trained and sent on jihad. According to law enforcement sources, both groups turned them down because the young men lacked references from trusted militants. The men made it to a safe house in the Pakistani city of Sargoda, where the father of one of the young men has a home. Suspicious neighbors called the police on them, and now these five young Americans are under arrest. And this is sort of how this sort of thing is supposed to work, at least in terms of the law enforcement response. The families, CARE, the FBI, the Pakistani police, even the Pakistani neighbors who appear to be all abiding by the not-so-old adage that if you see something, you should say something. Joining us now is Evan Coleman, NBC News terrorism analyst and the founder of GlobalTerrorAlert.com. Evan, thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much for having me. Do you believe these guys uh, were doing what they are suspected of. Is, does this seem credible? Five young American Muslims uh, suddenly going off to try to fight American troops. Well, it fits right into a pattern we've seen happen within the past year in several other different cases. We had the case down in Atlanta where two individuals, local Atlanta area college students, sought to go to Pakistan and get training from either Lashkari Taiba or Jaish Mohammed reach somehow al-Qaeda or the Taliban and then come back to the United States and carry out some kind of terrorist attack. And in the same vein, we've also seen several instances now where families are coming forward and approaching law enforcement, whether it's from the Somali community, the Pakistani community, the community in general. And they're coming forward and they're saying, we don't know what happened to our sons. We don't know whether it was a cleric who radicalized them. We don't know if it was an internet website. But they've disappeared and we think they're on their way into a conflict zone. So hopefully that's a pattern we're going to see continuing because these are exactly the kind of people that al-Qaeda would like to recruit. They're not that sophisticated, but they have U.S. passports and they're willing to die. And in terms of affiliations, this is not a situation in which these young men were at least seem to be of attending a radical mosque or any other obvious radical affiliations of any kind. Do we know anything about why they might have been radicalized if well, they weren't? That's what's so bizarre is that these guys are self-radicalized over the Internet. They were sharing jihadi videos with each other. They were sharing these ideas on the Internet. But what's most unusual about this case is the suggestion, and it hasn't been proven yet, but the suggestion that an al-Qaeda recruiter by the name of Saifullah noticed this activity activity on YouTube and contacted them over YouTube saying, you know, come join us. Mm -hmm. And that kind of level of interactivity, that's quite impressive. We've seen self-radicalization on the internet before. We've seen people reading stuff and taking this and moving forward with it. People like, obviously, S Sergeant Malik Hassan down in Fort Hood. But the idea that Al-Qaeda would recruit over the internet directly that's something new. We have to see whether or not that pans out. How important is it that these two groups that these young men approached said, no, we're not interested in you? Well, that's another phenomenon that we're seeing. And that happened also with the case of the two Atlanta area college students, that these guys went to them and Lashkar looked at them and said, hold on a second. We don't really trust them. I think one of the reasons that we're seeing this is because Lashkar i Taiba, Jaish Mohammed, they're realizing that these guys might be U.S. spies. Mm. They know they're under the microscope. I mean, Lashkar just came up yesterday in reference to the case in Chicago, the David Headley case. So the idea that Lashkar is under the microscope, that's obvious. So I think they're afraid now. Let's make sure these guys are who they say they are. They're not U.S. spies. And these guys, look, they didn't speak Urdu. They looked very funny. They looked westernized. Ordinarily, Lashkar might give them training. Jaish might give them training. But under the current environment with what's going on in Pakistan, I think these groups fairly wisely said they're too much of a liability. It's the nexus of law enforcement and the war on terrorism, with law enforcement starting to seem like, uh, at least in this case, it really worked to bring these guys to the surface when they needed to yep, be. Yep. Evan Coleman, NBC News terrorism analyst, GlobalTerrorAlert.com founder. It's great to have your input on this. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.